All right, well, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Rob Hawes, and I've got the pleasure of moderating this first session. And uh, I just want to express my gratitude to all of you for, for being here. Uh, we've got a, a stellar uh, group of individuals presenting on this first session on the esophagus. And so I think with, without further ado, we'll, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce the first person on our list, uh, Pete Carillas. Um, he needs no introduction, but really, um, he is the nidus that began uh, the world domination of the esophagus that's occurred at Northwestern University. Um, he's a, an incredible contributor to our understanding of, of the esophagus. He's a, a prolific publisher, a, a great clinician, and, and a, just a really, really good guy. And I've asked him to, to sort of pick his brain in, in a sense uh, and sort of globally look at uh, the way he thinks about uh, dysphagia. So I've asked him to, to just talk about the systematic approach to the diagnosis and optimal management of dysphagia. So Pete, uh, welcome my friend. Thanks Rob, thanks for the 15 minutes too. <laughs> so if you've only got 15 minutes, spend a lot of it taking a history. And taking a history can get you through a lot of these issues as to where to start. Uh, you know, is it oropharyngeal, esophageal, is it solids, liquids? Do they get obstruction with regurgitation? Is it a constant phenomena or an intermittent phenomena? Do they have reflux, allergies? Did it start all of a sudden? Is it progressive? Have they had radiation? Once you get through these things, I think it, it uh, it helps a lot. And the last item of opiate use is particularly important because so many people are on opiates at this point and this has a profound effect on esophageal motility. These are all examples of opiate-induced esophageal dysfunction. You can get outflow obstruction, you can get spasm, you can get things that look like achalasia or jackhammer esophagus. So history is extremely important. But regardless of what the history tells you, it's somewhat inevitable that you start with doing an endoscopy because that's where you get the most information. And I'm not going to belabor all of these possibilities because actually Dr. Hirano has an absolutely superb talk following me, which I had a chance to preview. But let it be clear that he has wonderful examples of what you can detect endoscopically. Are there GERD symptoms? If there are, then you're going to do a PPI trial. If there are proximal symptoms, you're going to want to get an x-ray that shows you one of those blind zones that uh, ECO will detail. In the proximal esophagus, you'll see cricopharyngeal bars, Zanker's diverticuli. And if none of that works, you'll end up calling it functional. But now we're getting into the solid and liquid, and I'm going to focus primarily on this, the motility aspect of dysphagia. Because, like I say, Eco is going to talk primarily about uh, solid food dysphagia. And high-resolution manometry. What does high-resolution manometry tell you? Well, it's told us a lot about the achalasia spectrum, and it has informed us somewhat about spastic disorders and absent contractility, although I have to say that this remains a very difficult area. The other thing it has made clear is that there's no gold standard when you're talking about motility disorders, that in fact there's FLIP and there's an esophagram, and these are three complementary studies, and a lot of times you're the diagnosis is not entirely clear. You're going to end up using two or even all three of these. And increasingly, it's to detect this achalasia spectrum. And I'm calling it a spectrum because we're past the point of dilating achalasia where it's a, uh, it's a big baggy esophagus. Now we're talking about the earlier phases of the disease where there might just be outflow obstruction or it might be somewhat subtle. And that's, uh, if you think about it, that's what you should expect 
because you don't wake up one morning with full-blown achalasia. There's a process there. You have a little difficulty, you have more difficulty, the esophagus gets outflow obstruction, and then slowly, you know, you get this process of dilatation. But with the widespread use of high-resolution manometry, we've gotten rid of all the easy, early cases, I mean the easy cases. We're now into the early cases, and that's, uh, that's why it's gotten so hard, and that's why what, what turned out, uh, or what started out to be a simple thing like this, this is now uh, Chicago classification version four, by the way, where you picked up type one, two, or three achalasia just with absent peristalsis and either no contractile activity, panesophageal pressurization, and spastic activity in the esophagus. Now you're realizing that, well, uh, not all type one achalasia has an IRP over 15, so sometimes you have to tease it out and you gotta go to uh, a secondary, secondary position, because what are you trying to differentiate it from? From absent contractility. So believe it or not, you know, a scleroderma type esophagus looks a lot like type 1 achalasia. They both have no peristaltic activity, and they both have uh, uh, basically a sphincter down at the end, but not all of achalasic sphincters are going to have an IRP greater than 15, sometimes it's greater than 10, sometimes it's as low as five. So you're gonna to have to do provocative maneuvers. The other sticky point was this EGJ outflow obstruction. And in the earlier versions of um, the Chicago classification, this was getting treated as achalasia a lot. But it isn't always achalasia. So, so now we are saying, well, you gotta have a confirmatory test with either timed barium esophagram or a FLIP study. And if those things are normal, you basically have no clinically relevant EGJ outflow obstruction, and you shouldn't be treating this as achalasia. So let's get into the nitty gritty here. Uh, this is a classic slide at this point. So you have type one, two, three in achalasia. And then in the lower right there, you've got EGJ outflow obstruction. The key element there being this compartmentalized pressurization between what is still a preserved contractile front and the EGJ. And here you see there's an IRP of 28. So how do you, how do you determine which of those are real and which are not real? Well, that's where all of those arrows came in with uh, CC version four. Here's an example. So this is a rapid drink challenge. Both of these people had, uh, I mean, this is the same person. You're looking at, on the left, a normal response to 200 ml ingestion, where with repetitive swallows, you see how the EGJ relaxes completely and the IRP is nil. On the right side, it actually brings out obstructive physiology, and that's what you're looking for. So now with a rapid drink challenge, you're seeing an IRP go up to 16, but more importantly, you're seeing this compartmentalized pressurization and some spastic activity in the distal sphincter. So you will bring out things with a um, challenge. Here's another example using a challenge to clarify a, uh, a diagnosis. You have a high IRP on the left. You change the position, so you go to position number two, which is upright in this case, and now the IRP falls under 12, which is the upper limit of normal for an upright posture. And on the right, you see the complementary TVE, and everything passes, including a tablet. So something that was EGJ outflow obstruction becomes no relevant EGJ outflow obstruction. How about flip? Well. This is a technology that was actually innovated at Northwestern. And uh, it's basically a device that uses impedance planimetry at multiple locations along the distal esophagus to give you two pieces of information, cross-sectional area and pressure. When we first used this, this was the type of representation that we would get, because we were interrogating primarily the lower esophageal sphincter. 
So you can see the uh, constricted area at the bottom, hourglass type thing, and you could get the distensive characteristics of the lower esophageal sphincter. So you could get pressure diameter type data. But as we used that more, we, uh, we kind of got curious about what was going on above, what all of these cross-sectional area variations were. And lo and behold, when you take this data set and analyze it the way you analyze high-resolution manometry, you get something that looks a lot like high-resolution manometry. But in fact, this is esophageal <laughs> diameter topography. So you're looking at secondary peristalsis. And uh, we started looking at that in great detail. Uh, this is a series now of uh, 700 patients looking at the distensibility index and the maximal diameter. And you get it by looking at those points. So those are the distensibility index at the three points where it's greatest. And that's the normal range for you over there. It's uh, three to eight. And then that's the maximal diameter at the 70 mil fill rate. And it's 21 millimeters. And that normally ranges from about 16 to 22. This is what achalasia will look like. Note the low DI and the very low max diameter. This is what scleroderma looks like. So again, this can be a difficult distinction in some cases, but here the distinction is quite obvious. You have a DI of 10 and a maximum diameter of 21. So that data set allowed us to define these three groups of normal EGJ outflow, borderline, or reduced. I think a very important concept here is that we're no longer going to normal, abnormal, but we're recognizing that no matter what you do, there's always a gray zone. So you're looking at borderline in the middle where you're meeting some criteria but not others, and these are the ones that you end up having to scrutinize the most, generally with more than one methodology of <clears throat> interpretation. And this is now comparative data looking at HRM versus a FLIP analysis of outflow. These are disorders of EGJ outflow on HRM, and look how they panned out on FLIP. Most of them are in the red zone there, but there's some borderline ones and there's some normal ones. And I circled the two, or actually Dusty Carlson circles the two, because these were scleroderma patients that had disordered EGJ outflow on HRM, but clearly normal on FLIP. These were normal on HRM, and most of them are in the normal range. But again, you see some degree of disagreement, and that is inevitable because none of these tests are perfect. So using those uh, normal, borderline, or reduced, among 241 patients with reduced EGG, EGG outflow, 86% had a conclusive HRM disorder of EGJ outflow. And among 203 patients with normal, 99% had normal HRM. So if you're doing FLIP in conjunction with endoscopy, you're gonna resolve most cases at the time of the endoscopy. If it's normal, it's gonna be normal. And most cases of achalasia are going to be easily detected this way. And how do you treat it? Well, this is a meta-analysis data, looking now at, uh, I was supposed to say something about management, so I'm gonna talk about managing achalasia, because my 15 minutes doesn't let me talk about everything, but anyway. Uh, this is type one achalasia, point being, POEM has emerged as the way to go here. It even eclipses laparoscopic heller myotomy. For type 1 achalasia, I think you're in that box. Type 2 achalasia is the easiest form to treat. Basically, the three dominant treatments are all pretty good, but again, POEM is up top. I don't think there's much of an argument for a laparoscopic approach up front anymore. <laughs> 
For type three achalasia, where you have a spastic segment of the esophagus, poem shines, because here you can, you can tailor the length of the myotomy to the length of the spastic segment. So what did that tell us? Well, they're all good, but uh, for Heller myotomy, 81%, 92, 71. So the subtype, subtypes certainly matter. For poem, they're all higher. So no, this is not an experiment anymore. And poem was more successful than laparoscopic myotomy for both type 1 and type 3 achalasia. I think laparoscopic Heller myotomy is on the way out as, a, as an intervention, as a primary intervention for achalasia. Pneumatic uh, dilation had lower but acceptable rates compared with POEM and laparoscopic myotomy for type 2. It's a solid argument for pneumatic dilation in type 2 and EGJ outflow obstruction. And the expanding universe of achalasia, obstructive physiology is a hallmark of symptomatic motor disorders. It affects either the EGJ, the distal esophagus, or both. Achalasia has been historically underdiagnosed, even with HRM. These tests are all complementary. Most of what we used to call DES is misdiagnosed type 3 achalasia. POEM is likely the optimal treatment for syndromes with both EGJ and distal esophageal physiology, and always inquire about opiate use. My 15 minutes is gone. So I'm going to simply say that if you're selecting among these treatment options, there's high quality evidence for very little of it. And most of it ends up being subjective when you get down to all of those distal features down at the bottom. I mean, it's high quality evidence only for looking at the type of achalasia or age. But when you look at all these other factors, such as advanced disease, hiatus hernia, comorbidities, obesity, et cetera, you're balancing the uh, strengths and weaknesses of the various treatment options. So the take home points here, an accurate history is essential for expediting management, narrow the focus to structural, motility, or sensory, EGJ with EGD with biopsy is the primary evaluation. Pair it with FLIP if a motor disorder is suspected. Motor disorders are rare. GERD is common. GERD causes dysphagia. EMDs are diagnosed based on functional abnormalities. There are no functional uh, biomarkers here, so give up on the concept of a gold standard. And always inquire about opiate use. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Pete. So it's next my pleasure to introduce Sachin Wani. Um, Sachin is a professor uh, uh, of medicine at the University of Colorado. Uh, he is a, a noted international expert on, on Barrett's esophagus and, and other things of the esophagus, and he's just a, a really, really good friend as well. So uh, we've asked Sachin to uh, talk to us about an update on Barrett's esophagus uh, and tell us about best practices for screening and surveillance. Sachin, welcome, my friend. Thank you so much for that uh, kind introduction, Rob, and what an honor it is to be speaking to you this morning. I want to thank Sham, Rob, G, and the entire team uh, for this invitation, and my task in the next 15 minutes is to give you best practice advice for screening and surveillance in Barrett's esophagus. Somehow this is not advancing. Maybe hit the thing. Oh, there. Okay, perfect. So let's start with a few uh, basics here. Barrett's esophagus, as we all know, um, is the only identifiable pre-malignant condition for esophageal adenocarcinoma, a condition characterized by the replacement of the normal stratified squamous epithelium with columnar-lined esophagus and the presence of intestinal metaplasia on mm -hmm. histology. Barrett's esophagus can result in esophageal cancer, a cancer that still continues to have a dismal five-year survival rate of less than 
Let's spend the next few minutes talking about screening for Barrett's endosophageal adenocarcinoma. And these are uh, recommendations provided by our GI societies, and I'd like you to focus on the column right in the middle, which are the most recent recommendations provided by the American College of Gastroenterology that suggest that you should consider screening for Barrett's endosophageal cancer in individuals with chronic reflux disease with the presence of three or more risk factors, and these include males age greater than 50, Caucasian race, central adiposity, history of smoking, and a family history of Barrett's and esophageal cancer. Now, despite the significant face validity for the screening paradigm, we know that there are several limitations that we face when it comes to screening for this disease, as highlighted on this slide. But the statistic that bothers me the most is the fact that less than 10% of our patients with esophageal adenocarcinoma have a prior diagnosis of Barrett's esophagus, really suggesting that our current clinical referral practices fail to identify the majority of at-risk individuals. This is despite the fact that we perform more than 2 million upper endoscopies here in the United States for reflux alone. When you think about the burden of screening, there have been several um, reports suggesting that the um, um, burden for screening in Barrett's and esophageal cancer can range depending on the guideline that you're looking at from 20 million adults to as many as 120 million adults here in the United States who are at risk for Barrett's and esophageal cancer. An important question to answer at this point is, how often are individuals who are at risk for Barrett's and esophageal cancer getting screened? And I will tell you, these numbers are fairly depressing. These are two observational studies suggesting that about 30% of individuals who are at risk for Barrett's and esophageal cancer have had an upper endoscopy at some point to get screened for Barrett's. And these numbers are actually misleading. When you actually drill into these data, you'll realize that only 10% of these individuals had an upper, upper endoscopy done for purely screening purposes for Barrett's and esophageal cancer. And this slide just highlights some of the barriers that we as gastroenterologists and primary care physicians face when it comes to screening for Barrett's. And it comes down to three main factors. Lack of knowledge of risk factors associated with Barrett's, limited knowledge of published guidelines, and frankly, just not having enough time to actually think about screening for Barrett's and esophageal cancer in our limited clinic times. So where do we need to go? I think we're in the midst of a major paradigm shift in the way we will actually screen for Barrett's and esophageal cancer. We know that performing an upper endoscopy on every individual who's at risk for Barrett's is just not a tenable option. We will be using these non-endoscopic cell collection devices that can be administered in our clinic practices by gastroenterologists, by primary care physicians, physician extenders, where you can actually swallow these devices, they get deployed in the stomach in the form of a sponge or a balloon. It collects cells from the distal esophagus. These devices then get sent to a central lab, and they analyze these devices for biomarkers that are associated with Barrett's and esophageal cancer. These include trifoil factor three and methylated DNA markers. If these results are positive, these patients then get referred for an upper endoscopy for screening purposes. And based on um, some really good observational data and data from one randomized control trial, we felt that it was important to put this in our most recent guidelines, again through the ACG, where we suggested that a swallowable non-endoscopic capsule device <laughs> combined with a biomarker is an alternative to screening for Barrett's uh, in individuals with chronic reflux symptoms and other risk factors. We gave this a conditional recommendation, and this was recently endorsed by the AGA Clinical Practice Updates Committee as well. 
Where we really need to go is to have a home-based test for esophageal cancer. Imagine if you could actually administer a test at home similar to the concept of fit testing. And this is what we're investigating at the present time at the University of Colorado. Imagine if you could swallow a capsule size of a vitamin pill or an antibiotic. You swallow this device. <laughs> this string actually stays in the esophagus for an hour and can actually detect all the biomarkers that are associated with Barrett's esophagus, similar to the sponge or the balloon. So stay tuned. Hopefully, we'll have results available in the next year. But this is where we need to go. And similar to the concept of colorectal cancer screening, the best screening test is the one that actually gets done. What we also need are these prediction models, models that outperform reflux alone to screen individuals for Barrett's esophagus. We know that reflux alone is a poor criterion for predicting the presence of Barrett's and esophageal adenocarcinoma. Imagine if you could have a prediction tool that is embedded in your electronic health record system and it flags patients who are at risk for Barrett's and esophageal cancer. These are my last comments, my philosophical comments on where we need to go for screening uh, in Barrett's. We know that the screening rates are low, and if we're really trying to address the burden, the epidemiology of esophageal cancer, the unfortunate reality is that wrong patients are being referred for an upper endoscopy. Reflux alone is not such a good screening criterion, and Alternative strategies are required to de-emphasize reflux alone for screening purposes. We, of course, need effectiveness data from these non-endoscopic screening modalities. We need to understand what our patients feel about these different screening modalities. What do they value? What are their preferences? And again, studies that are being conducted at the present time. And lastly, we will make no dent on the epidemiology of esophageal cancer if we do not collaborate with our primary care physicians. These are individuals who are gatekeepers for these patients with reflux disease and other risk factors for Barrett's esophagus. Now let's shift gears and talk a little bit about surveillance in Barrett's esophagus. We know that Barrett's esophagus actually progresses to esophageal adenocarcinoma in a stepwise and a probabilistic fashion. It goes through these different stages of Barrett's to low-grade dysplasia, to high-grade dysplasia, and then to esophageal adenocarcinoma. And despite all the advances that we've made in the field of biomarkers and Barrett's and risk of progression, in 2023, the degree of dysplasia provided by our pathologist still is the best biomarker we have to determine appropriate management, i.e. surveillance versus endoscopic eradication therapy. You should know that our guidelines actually recommend surveillance in patients with non-dysplastic Barrett's esophagus. This is given the fact that natural history studies suggest that the overall risk of progression in patients with non-dysplastic Barrett's esophagus to adenocarcinoma is low. It's about 0.25% per year. Put it differently, one in 400 patients with non-dysplastic Barrett's will actually progress to esophageal cancer. Our guidelines also recommend that when you do encounter columnar-aligned esophagus during your screening exam or when you're bringing patients back for their surveillance exams, when you have a patient with non-dysplastic Barrett's, you should be taking biopsies using the Seattle biopsy protocol, which entails taking biopsies in a four-quadrant fashion every one to two centimeters and taking targeted biopsies from any visible lesion that you may encounter during your endoscopy, no matter how subtle that visible lesion may be. It's also important to remember that those biopsies that you take from any visible lesions needs to be submitted in a separate jar to your uh, pathologist. One of the most important contributions that we made to this recent guideline through the American College of Gastroenterology is providing a risk stratified approach based on the length of the Barrett segment for our surveillance intervals. We now recommend that if you have a Barrett segment that's three centimeters or greater, bring those patients back every three years. On the other hand, if you have a Barrett segment that's less than three centimeters, it's perfectly fine to bring these patients back every five years for their surveillance exam. 
We also stress the importance of not taking biopsies from patients with a normal squamous columnar junction or the presence of an irregular Z-line, as long as you don't see any visible lesions within the distal esophagus. Important to recognize that our primary goal for doing surveillance exams is to identify these visible lesions that you may encounter within the Barrett segment. These are lesions that harbor high-grade dysplasia or esophageal cancer and merit endoscopic eradication therapy. Now, consistent with what we've seen with the concept of post-colonoscopy colorectal cancer, there's a growing body of evidence suggesting that we can actually miss lesions during our upper endoscopy, miss lesions that harbor high-grade dysplasia or cancer. To address the quality of endoscopy that we do, we recently introduced these two terms, post-endoscopy esophageal neoplasia or PEEN, and post-endoscopy esophageal cancer, defined by the presence of high-grade dysplasia or cancer that gets detected before the next recommended surveillance exams in patients with non-dysplastic Barrett's esophagus. Now, a logical question at this point is, how common are these entities? And these data will hopefully convince you that you need to pay closer attention to these two entities. A systematic review showed that nearly 21 to 27 percent of all all high-grade dysplasias and cancers can be categorized as peak or peen. In a recent population-based study using the Nordic data, we showed that nearly 25% of all esophageal cancers can be categorized as peak. So what are some of the things that you can do in your practice to avoid missing lesions, reduce the rates of peak and peen in your practice? We should all be using a combination of high-definition white light endoscopy and virtual chromoendoscopy in every patient undergoing a screening or a surveillance exam, of course, along with the Seattle biopsy uh, protocol. This video just highlights some of the basic tenets of a high-quality endoscopic exam. It starts off by really identifying the landmarks in the distal esophagus, which include the diaphragmatic pins, the top of the gastric folds, also using a distal cap when you have patients referred to you with a diagnosis of dysplasia. Take adequate time inspecting the Barrett segment. Clean the esophagus of any debris. As I mentioned earlier, use the combination of high-definition white light endoscopy and virtual chromoendoscopy. We should all be using standardized classification and grading systems, such as the PROG classification system for the length of the Barrett segment, and use the Paris classification for describing any visible lesion that you may see within the Barrett segment. It's also important to perform a good retroflexed view of the gastroesophageal junction and the gastric cardium. And only when you've accomplished all these nine steps should you ask for <coughs> the biopsy forcep to take biopsy using the Seattle biopsy protocol. Some of the things that you can do to enhance your dysplasia detection rate, advanced sampling techniques such as wide area transepithelial sampling. This really uses an abrasive brush which may actually improve your dysplasia detection rate as shown in this systematic review and meta-analysis. Now, whether this sampling technique can actually replace your Seattle biopsy protocol is the focus of an ongoing multi-center randomized control trial the SWAT-BE study. And this study really is involving patients with non-dysplastic Barrett's where they are getting randomized to forcep biopsies and what sampling and our primary endpoint is the diagnostic yield of any dysplasia. This 2000 patient study will also allow us to develop and validate risk prediction models including contemporary biomarker panels. You should be aware of tissue systems pathology test, which is a uh, biomarker panel that could potentially allow us to better risk stratify patients with non-dysplastic Barrett's and with low-grade dysplasia. 
It's worth talking about this patient population, low-grade dysplasia within Barrett segment. We can spend um, an entire morning talking about the controversies related to this diagnosis, but note that our guidelines actually suggest that you take a patient-centered approach to the management of this diagnosis. Recognize that both surveillance and endoscopic eradication therapy are perfectly fine treatment options for this diagnosis. To address several of the controversies related to this diagnosis, we've embarked on the SERVENT trial, a multi-center randomized control trial where patients with confirmed low-grade dysplasia are randomized to endoscopic eradication therapy and to surveillance, and our primary endpoint is neoplastic progression, an endpoint of high-grade dysplasia or cancer. We will be assessing for patient-centered outcomes and evaluate contemporary biomarkers to identify those patients with low-grade dysplasia who are at the highest risk for progression to high-grade dysplasia and cancer. And of course, incredibly grateful to these 21 centers and to the NIDDK for sponsoring this study. Where do we go next? As Sham rightfully uh, pointed out, artificial intelligence, without a doubt, will bring about the greatest disruption to our clinical uh, practice. What we really need are these risk stratification algorithms that combine clinical variables, <coughs> endoscopic findings, and biomarkers, again, to improve risk stratification. And then finally, we need intervention trials to really improve the quality of endoscopy that we perform uh, for our patients with very its esophagus. Um, some of my friends are aware that we are uh, a tennis-obsessed uh, family. These are pictures of my uh, twins when they got to meet um, their idol, uh, Mr. Nadal, in Mallorca this summer. And similar to uh, their tennis career, um, I think we've come a long way when it comes to management of Barrett's esophagus, but we still have miles to go. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Sachin. Great, uh, great review. It's now my pleasure to introduce uh, Aiko Hirano. Um, I w attended uh, the Northwestern uh, meeting for a number of years, and I got to know Aiko uh, through that meeting, and I've come to respect him greatly for his knowledge and uh, his ability uh, endoscopically. So um, it was actually uh, watching him do a, a, an eosinophilic esophagitis uh, uh, dilation uh, in Chicago that changed my practice in the way that I, I do dilations there. So I've asked him to expand on that and uh, teach us about uh, how he manages um, uh, esophageal strictures. So I could welcome my friend. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Rob and Shyam for, and the Orlando Health Team, not only for the invitation, but um, also for all their hospitality in organizing this fantastic conference. Um, I'll be discussing the management of strictures. My disclosures are listed here. I will discuss off-label use of medications. So for stricture management in the 15 minutes that I've also been given, um, there are three things I'd like to try to address. How can we optimize stricture assessment? If you can't see the stricture, you can't manage it. Secondly, how do we manage refractory strictures? And finally, what about future medical approaches? So there are three blind spots in the endoscopic evaluation of dysphagia, particularly regarding strictures. The first blind spot is the esophageal inlet. And there's two reasons for this. First of all, I think all of us exceed the speed limit when we look at the cervical esophagus. We go a little bit too quickly when we pass through the upper esophageal sphincter. And the second reason is because there's a natural constriction that occurs there, right? The upper esophageal sphincter is located at the inlet and it can hide strictures that are in that location. One example is a cervical web. Again, these are often situated in the very proximal esophagus. Sometimes you will see them in association with an inlet patch, where the inlet patch secretes hydrochloric acid and produces a peptic-like stricture in the cervical esophagus. Another important entity that Peter Carillus mentioned is called the cricopharyngeal bar. By its very name, it's made of the cricopharyngeus muscle, and it is the upper esophageal sphincter muscle itself that can hypertrophy, become fibrosis, and cause obstruction. These two entities, again, can be overlooked when you just glance through the cervical esophagus, you can miss these. Just word of note here, the cervical webs typically occur anteriorly, which you're seeing here, and the CP bars typically occur posteriorly, so there's a very different impression. These can be, both be very effectively managed by a savory dilation. Oops, let me go back one here. Okay, 
So another blind spot, a radar blind spot in endoscopic evaluation strictures is the EG junction. Same reason, because we have a constriction there created not only by the lower salvage sphincter, but also by the diaphragmatic hiatus that can hide strictures, clinically relevant strictures. Now, you, if you don't really see a stricture here, but what esophagologists do um, is that they take their time, and while we take our time, we insufflate. We insufflate the proximal stomach. When you insufflate the stomach, you induce a belch reflex called the transient lower esophageal sphincter relaxation. During that belch reflex, the LES relaxes, but also the EGJ moves upwards into the chest by two to three centimeters. So you're actually displacing the EGJ into the, into the thoracic cavity. So you can see strictures that were initially invisible. So now you'll notice during the belch reflex, you can clearly see there was a peptic stricture there that was invisible uh, on first view. That last view is just a picture of a dilation. I did a 60 millimeter dilation with that with a balloon just to show that was a clinically relevant stricture that was indeed not visible at first. Now, once you identify a stricture at the EGJ, the next question you ask yourself is, <clears throat> what is the diameter of that stricture? Now, looking antegrade, it can be very difficult to ascertain the diameter of a stricture. We all think we're great endoscopists. If I ask you, is that a 12 millimeter or 14 or 16 or 18 millimeter, I think it'd be very difficult to ascertain. So a very simple trick that esophagologists do is a retroflex. <clears throat> we all do this routinely, but you want to retroflex and look at the Z-line retroflex and look at the stricture retroflex. This is very easy when you've got a hiatal hernia, but you can also enhance this view if you induce, again, that belch reflex. Get the patient to belch, insufflate the stomach. During the belch, the esophagus will shorten, and you can get that pseudo-hernia-type formation. And here you can clearly see the strictures. Left-hand panel would be a 10 millimeter, then the second panel would maybe a 14, 15 millimeter panel. Number panel number three would be like an 18 millimeter or more diameter stricture, which you don't need to dilate. And the bottom right panel, maybe a 13, 14 millimeter. So you can clearly get a much more accurate determination of diameter by looking retroflexed. Now, the third blind spot is the narrow caliber esophagus. This is a patient with eosinophilic esophagitis, my favorite topic. You can see edema, you can see some furrowing of the esophagus, and some subtle rings of the esophagus. But I challenge you as you watch this video, do you see a stricture of the esophagus? Our eyes are good at picking up focal strictures, but we're not so good at picking up when the whole esophagus is narrowed. With diffuse narrowing, it's very tricky to detect the stricture. Now, what I did in this particular case, I knew the patient had some narrowing, and I knew they had dysphagia, they had EOE, so I did a dilation with a savory dilation. This is the type of case that I showed Rob before. Um, so here, after a savory dilation, I did a 14, a 42 French, then a 45 and 48, no resistance at all to the passage of the savory dilator, but look at the bloody mess that I created by doing the savory dilation. This is scary to look at, it's kind of um, painful to look at, it's painful for a patient's experience, but this is not a complication. This is an expected outcome of an effective dilation. But it just goes to show you that that stricture was really hard to appreciate on endoscopic view. It's only after I dilated that it became apparent that there was indeed a narrow caliber esophagus. So this type of experience has now been shown in, in studies. This is a study from Mayo Clinic uh, by Dave Katzka and Jeff Alexander and colleagues from Mayo, where they compared endoscopy detection of strictures with a radiographic detection of a stricture. So they did barium esophagrams in all these EOE patients, and then went back to the endoscopy reports to see how often did the endoscopist detect the strictures. And if you look at that last row, strictures that were less than or equal to 13 millimeters, and I think we would all agree that that's a clinically relevant stricture, detection by the Mayo Clinic endoscopist was only 33%. 67% of the strictures that were less than 13 millimeters were missed by the endoscopist. So it's a little bit humbling when we think about it this way that we do miss a lot of these narrow caliber strictures. So a more precise way that we have now in our armamentarium that you can use, it's not routine clinical practice yet, but you can use is the technology that Peter Carillus mentioned called impedance plane material flip. This is the flip that's being used first in the proximal esophagus, so that top panel is the upper esophagus and the bottom panel is the lower esophagus. And you can very accurately detect these subtle strictures of the esophagus within a 0.1 millimeter accuracy, uh, whereas much better than you can with a naked eye. And this is the same patient shown on flip, and patients shown on a barium esophagram, showing you that diffuse narrowing of the mid to distal esophagus. So again, I've outlined these three radar blind spots. We've got the inlet, the EG junction, and a narrow caliber esophagus. 
So for all three areas, you can use a barium esophagram. When you do a barium esophagram, I'd encourage you to ask for a barium tablet that will get stuck if there's a stricture there. The other technique you can do is to shoot first and ask questions later. That is, just dilate it with a savory and see if you get a mucosal disruption. That's another way that some, um, some clinicians may do. And the other ways you can use for the easy junction, we talked about using that belt reflex Make that, make that a tool in your armamentarium for looking for these subtle EGJ strictures and also using that retroflex view to calibrate the stricture size. And for diffuse narrow caliber esophagus, we now have flip technology. Second question, how to manage a stricture once you've detected it and how to manage particularly refractory strictures. So how do you define a refractory stricture? If you go to W.C. Fields, he said, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again, then quit. No use being a damn fool about it. <laughs> so W.C. Fields, if you asked him how many times should I dilate that stricture before I give up or try something else, he would say three times. If you go to somebody more erudite like Albert Einstein, he defined insanity as doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. So someone more wise as Albert Einstein would say, you give the stricture one time to dilate and if you've given it a really good dilation, that should be good enough before you go on to something else. So we have one to three. If you go back to Michael Coachman uh, from, um, from Penn, he defined a refractory stricture as inability to successfully establish a diameter of 14 millimeters using five dilation sessions over two week intervals. Now that may seem a bit aggressive, but it of course depends on what the stricture etiology is and how small was that diameter when you started. If you started with a three millimeter diameter stricture, that's gonna be different than you started with a 12 millimeter diameter stricture. So there's some nuance in how many times you're gonna try. He defined a recurrent stricture as inability to maintain a luminal diameter for four weeks or longer once you've achieved that 14 millimeter diameter. So there's refractory and recurrent strictures. What are our strategies? What can we do about these refractory or recurrent strictures? Well, our armamentarium really is just to repeat dilations, and that's often what we end up doing. We just repeat, repeat, repeat at some interval. You can use steroid injections. You can use endoscopic incisional therapy, structural plasty, stent placement, self-bougenage, something that's fortunately very rarely practiced, and a last resort would be surgery. I just want, not gonna go through all these, but just a little bit of evidence about uh, which modality you can use. Uh, this is a, a slide that just makes the point that uh, the etiology of the stricture does determine how often you have to repeat the dilation. The strictures that most commonly have to be have, have undergo repeated dilations are caustic congestions, anastomotic strictures, and radiation. The least common are Shatsky ring. Usually one or two dilations are sufficient for a Shatsky ring. And I would put eosinophilic esophagitis, which wasn't on this list of uh, etiologies, somewhere in the middle. We typically have to repeat dilations in patients with eosinophilic esophagitis to get to a target diameter of about 16 or more millimeters. So going for the evidence for what uh, modalities we have for refractory strictures, I think the strongest evidence right now is for steroid injection. This is for focal strictures, and there have now been five placebo-controlled trials that have compared steroids to placebo, and four of the five trials showed benefit for steroids over placebo for reducing symptoms of dysphagia and also reducing the frequency of dilation. So I think pretty good level one evidence in favor of steroid injections. The other modality that we often think about doing are stents. Uh, stents for not for malignant, but for only for benign strictures. And there are some conceptual advantages of doing a stent for a benign stricture. So as an, unlike a savory dilation or TTS balloon dilation, stents offer you a continuous, gradual dilation over a long period of time. Typically, these stents are left in for about two to three months, during which time we expect the stricture to remodel around the stent. The other advantage of the stent is now in great hands as interventional gastroenterologists are able to do. The technical success rates are in excess of 95%. So this can be done, and there's a conceptual reason for to, uh, to do it. Now, the practical disadvantages to using a stent for benign strictures is migration in up to 50%, chest pain and bleeding, although those can typically be managed. But the biggest downside to stent placement for benign strictures is that inevitably, over 75% of those strictures will relapse symptomatically once you remove the stent. Uh, 
So the stents are not, not giving you a durable response in the vast majority of patients. So I would say based on this review, um, given the risks and uncertain benefits, uh, use of stenting for benign strictures should be individualized. You may have a patient that you think is a good candidate, but just keep in mind the durability of that response is likely going to be limited in the majority of patients. There are investigational therapies being looked at for endoscopic uh, treatment of refractory strictures, and this includes cryodilation. There was an abstract at DDW using cryodilation techniques. There's a drug eluding balloon dilation that's being looked at in a randomized controlled trial. Um, it, it's listed in clinicaltrials.gov, and I know Orlando Health is participating in this trial using a, a chemotherapy agent to try to uh, prevent fibrosis from occurring. Mitomycin C topical application has been used mostly in pediatric literature. There's no great studies on it, mostly pediatrics. Stem cell <clears throat> collagen and dermal patch application to a, to, a, um, um, to a stricture injury are being looked at by the Japanese groups, but only been studied in animal models to date. And finally, I saw this very intriguing report of endoscopic uh, stricture mucoplasty just published uh, by the J a Japanese group basically doing a surgical structural plasty endoscopically. You can see where they cut, cut the esophagus stricture longitudinally and then uh, suture it back or staple, uh, clip it back in a horizontal manner, just like a surgeon would do for a stricture. Finally, what about future approaches to stricture management? I think, wouldn't it be wonderful if we didn't have to do all these dilations? Dilations, I do, I do a lot of them but they are a pretty brutal procedure when you think about it. It's been done for decades, and it really hasn't advanced all that much. So could medical therapy perhaps stop or perhaps even reverse existing fibrosis? And a number of therapeutic targets in fibrosis are being examined for medical therapy for fibrosis. Now, I don't expect you to read this slide, but I just want to show you there's a very rich a listing of trials on clinicaltrials.gov, antifibrotic agents. Majority of these are being looked at for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, but many of these antifibrotic agents are being considered for things like liver cirrhosis, for inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's strictures, and also for esophageal strictures. Now, one patient that gave me a lot of pause about how I was managing strictures, particularly regarding dilation, I used to think every stricture needed to be dilated, was this physician, a pediatric phys uh, physician in Chicago that came to see me back in 2006 for dysphagia, had a diagnosis of eosinophilic esophagitis, and you can see a very high-grade stricture in the proximal to mid-esophagus. Esophageal diameter measured on fluoroscopic imaging was only six millimeters. I could not get through the, the esophagus using the diagnostic endoscope. And if you look at it endoscopically, that looks like a dense fibrotic stricture. Now, I put the patient on fluticasone, and I didn't hear back from him. And I got a little bit worried, and so I gave him a call two years later and asked him, how was he doing? I thought maybe he was just on a puree diet or something. And he said, doc, I've been doing great. Thanks so much for the fluticasone. And I didn't believe him. I thought maybe he must be like just chewing excessively or something like that. So I repeated his studies. Here's his repeat endoscopy and repeat fluoroscopic imaging, almost complete normalization of the esophageal diameter with medical therapy. There's still some subtle rings there of the esophagus, but for the most part, the diameter had normalized. So we studied this now prospectively in a uh, pilot study that was done at Northwestern. Uh, Dusty Carlson did this analysis where we use FLIP technology. Again, FLIP, I think, is the most accurate way to give you a precise estimate of stricture diameter. This is FLIP technology done before and after medical therapy. Here's a patient being studied before budesonide, esophageal caliber at seven millimeters on FLIP tech testing. After budesonide, after several weeks of budesonide, doubling of the diameter now to 13 millimeters. So with only medical therapy, no dilation performed in this particular patient. For the overall cohort in this proof of concept study, 15 patients studied. Again, almost every patient had an improvement in esophageal diameter with medical therapy alone, some diet, some medical therapy, uh, without dilation. 44% uh, had an improvement diameter of two millimeters or greater. And now we're seeing now phase three data, um, I'm sorry, phase two data, uh, double-blind placebo-controlled data, again, showing the efficacy of medical therapy for resolving strictures in eosinophilic esophagitis. This is one study, a phase two trial of dupilumab that studied patients with eosinophilic esophagitis. They, they were studied with FLIP testing before and after 12 weeks of dupilumab. If you compare the placebo patients, they had a worsening of their strictures. The patients who got the pilumab had an improvement in strictures. 
The overall improvement in structure diameter was three millimeters with the map compared to placebo. Again, no dilation, only medical therapy in this randomized placebo control trial. So to conclude structure management, First of all, we've shown that there are these blind spots on endoscopic evaluation. Although we all consider endoscopic assessment of structures to be standard of care, the focal inlet structures, EGJ stenoses, and the narrow caliber esophagus are important limitations that can be overcome using uh, uh, alternative methodologies. Steroid injection is an effective approach for refractory focal structures, not a great approach for diffuse structures. And future approaches include advanced endoscopic methods as well as hopefully targeted medical therapeutics. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Aiku. So Pete uh, complains so vigorously about only getting 15 minutes that I'm going to give him another 15 minutes. <laughs> Except I've given you another subject. So um, uh, I've asked uh, Pete to talk about uh, the bane of most of our existences, which is uh, those individuals with a, a sensitive esophagus. So I'm sure you're going to completely clarify this uh, issue for us and tell us how to easily manage these, these patients. Absolutely. <laughs> so I'm going to frame this around the management of presumed reflux symptoms. And this, I think, is the, the general algorithm. We tell people lifestyle modifications, weight loss, and acids, OTC meds. Sometimes we give them a PPI <laughs> prescription. If they've got alarm features, you get an endoscopy. And if that makes them happy, then you're happy, and that's that. If it doesn't make them happy, then uh, this is kind of what happens. It's the latter approach, you know, where you just increase and increase and increase. <laughs> uh, PCABs are up there now. Um, and this is, uh, I think, another example of insanity uh, because it, it works to a point, but if you really look at how often that works, it depends pretty much on what you're treating. If you're treating esophagitis, it's gonna work. But if you're treating symptoms, in this uh, graphic here, the blue is the placebo response, and the extension in green is what you get as a therapeutic gain. And it works for esophagitis. When you get the heartburn relief, the therapeutic gain gets less, uh, even less if it's non-erosive disease, regurgitation, it's less, chest pain. If they've got heartburn, it works, but otherwise it doesn't. Uh, so there's not that much merit to that. Uh, so you go to endoscopy. Even the ones that were happy eventually become unhappy because they read something or somebody told them something. So <laughs> endoscopy ends up being kind of a common outcome here, which is OK. We all like doing endoscopy. Sometimes you see uh, persistent esoph esophagitis, and that's a, a nice outcome because uh, you increase the acid inhibition. And you know, there's some logic to that. This is a study that I, I love this study. David Graham did this. It's a meta-analysis. It's, it's comparing the potency among the PPIs um, using the outcome of pH holding time in the stomach. And he managed to frame this in such a way that you could look at all of these drugs in terms of omipro omiprazole equivalents, OE. And look at that, pantoprazole, 20 milligrams, is equivalent to less than 5 milligrams of omeprazole. So they're not all the same, not all the same at all. And if you put them on this type of graphic and stack them up, yeah, BID on the right there is better than QD on the left. And look at venoprazan, which is now out there, by the way. You can't get it because the phone line's busy, but it's out there. I think that situation will get better. <laughs> Uh, so there is some merit to that, but honestly, persistent esophagitis is not your common finding. Sometimes you'll find eosinophilic esophagitis and uh, eco, this devised actually this uh, rating scale, the EREFS scale for looking at eosinophilic esophagitis. It's an interesting problem, and I don't think we really know the answer to it as to what the, the uh, relationship is between eosinophilic esophagitis and reflux esophagitis. Uh, 
First, we thought that uh, they were mutually exclusive. You know, and then we developed that PPI REE diagnosis. Then we kind of decided that they're just two different things, but I don't think we really know. Uh, the fact of the matter is, a lot of eosinophilic esophagitis responds to PPIs. Now, there's some other things that can happen on the way here, but I think what Rob wanted me to talk about was the normal endoscopy, so we're going to skip to that. What's normal? Well, I think we go past the esophagus too fast. We go past the EG junction too fast. And this is uh, now a white paper, which uh, I, I participated in, where we're looking at the, the anti-reflux barrier as an anatomic entity, recognizing that there's the flap valve, there's the sphincter, and there's the crural diaphragm. And just to say normal is not doing it justice. The flap valve is very important because this is a, an anatomic, it's, a, it's basically an end to side anastomosis so that pressure within the stomach seals the exit. And that's the first thing to go. But for that to work, you have to have an intra-abdominal segment of esophagus. And similar to what Eco was saying about you gotta stare at things for a while, here is the same person, you're looking at the EG junction and you're just insufflating it, and look what happens. You, you distend the stomach enough and you have this obvious hiatal hernia develop on the right. Now this person went to surgery and this is what was found surgically. So yes, that was the right interpretation of that endoscopy. They had a hiatal hernia. So it's just a lesson that uh, you got to look carefully to ascertain the integrity of the EG junction. And this is the AFS, the American Foregut Society Endoscopic Classification of the EGJ. Um, it's published in Foregut. Most important point here is the distinction between grade one and grade two. Look what happens. You lose the intra-abdominal segment of the esophagus. That's the beginning of the anatomic disruption of the EGJ. So anyway, back to what Rob really wanted me to talk about here, normal. <laughs> Symptoms control, great. Persistent regurgitation, well, these are people who, who you should think about procedural interventions. But then on the right there, you get persistent, troublesome heartburn, and there it's further evaluation and testing. Now this is where we get to Rome. And by the way, they're meeting right now, devising Rome 5, so hold your breath. I don't think it's going to be any different than four, though. But they, they split up non-erosive reflux disease into these entities of reflux hypersensitivity, functional heartburn, and true NERD. And they did it all on the basis of reflux testing, whether or not you have abnormal acid exposure and whether or not there is reflux symptom correlation. And, uh, you know, there's this big deal between reflux hypersensitivity and functional heartburn entirely on the basis of whether or not there's reflux symptom correlation. Well, that's an idealized outcome because I don't think you really get that kind of information, but uh, certainly the acid exposure part is real. But it, is it real? So here's the diamond study, which is a, something where actually Northwestern was the pH monitoring site for this study. John Dent orchestrated it. It wasn't conducted in the US. And it, they looked at symptoms in primary care. They did endoscopy. They did pH monitoring on them. They did a questionnaire. They did the whole thing. And if Rome was correct, the people with reflux esophagitis, that green piece of pie there would have been 100%. Well, it was 20%. And 43% had only abnormal acid exposure, 34% of them were normal. So, so Rome is truly an idealized thing. And here's another example of that. So if you look at the, uh, this is a, another study looking at pH monitoring with reflux symptom correlation now, and looking at the three Rome subgroups there, NERD, reflux hypersensitivity, and functional heartburn, 
And in terms of acid exposure time, yeah, there's a, there's a difference there between the hypersensitivity and the functional heartburn. They're normal, whereas the true nerds are abnormal. Same with the number of reflux events. Same with the uh, mean nocturnal baseline impedance. So that's just a way of looking at uh, the integrity of the mucosa. But here's where it gets interesting. The intensity of reflux symptoms as determined by a GERD-Q questionnaire, there's no longer any difference between the three. So they all think they have the same degree of reflux symptomatology. The EHASC, the esophageal hypersensitivity and anxiety scale, this too is the same among the three. The bottom line is it's only the EHAS score, the hypervigilance and anxiety scales that correlate with symptom severity. And another side issue, there's absolutely no difference between functional heartburn and reflux hypersensitivity by any of these metrics. So this important distinction made by Rome 4, soon to be 5, it doesn't mean anything. Because what you're looking at here is this evolution from altered physiology, obviously Barrett's and erosive esophagitis, to NERD, to reflux hypersensitivity, to functional heartburn. And there are two things going on here. With altered physiology, you're really looking at function of the barrier. So you're going to get testing options there. You're going to learn things from endoscopy, from high-resolution manometry, from pH impedance testing, da-da-da. And the things that predispose to that are the things we generally associate with reflux disease, obesity, hiatus hernia, diet, alcohol, smoking, and older age. But over here, with the altered perception, this is different. Here the treatments are psychology consults, neuromodulators, alternative medicine, mucosal protectants. And what modulates this? These people tend to have IBS, dyspepsia, anxiety, depression, hypervigilance, hypersensitivity, somatization, insomnia, fear. So you got to sort this out up front. And this was an example of us trying to do that, where we were matching treatments to reflux-like syndrome. So this is a group of experts, GIs, PCPs, one surgeon, so there's not going to be a lot of enthusiasm for surgery here. Perception of likely treat, treated benefit, and for erosive esophagitis, you, you see there was only one surgeon there, but anyway, PPIs, there was a lot of enthusiasm for. NERD, I think people recognize that the latter doesn't work too well there, and it worked even less well as you get into these other syndromes. Whereas, you know, antacids, alginates, eh, pretty good. Promotility drugs, nobody thought that worked. Behavioral interventions, here is where for the sensitive esophagus, there was a lot of enthusiasm. There's recognition that this is more the point than pharmacology, or that type of pharmacology. Lifestyle modifications, again, that's going to make a difference. Neuromodulators. I think there are clear examples of reflux hypersensitivity and functional heartburn where they have a, a phenomenal effect, but it's certainly not evident in randomized controlled trials. It's still worth trying. Non-reflux management, uh, whatever that is. <laughs> so management of refractory reflux symptoms emphasize the importance of lifestyle and behavioral modifications weight loss, diet modifications, adjust eating and sleeping patterns, use targeted therapy with alginates, antacids, and H2RAs instead of open-ended PPIs because that just leads to a lot of PPI use. Use psychometric tools such as EHAS early on to identify the perceptual drivers of symptoms. Be pragmatic about PPI use. Establish the need for chronic or escalated therapy. Don't just go up the ladder. Sometimes you go down the ladder. Use endoscopy and manometry to tailor therapy. Exclude alternative diagnoses such as EOE and alternative treatments. Mainly patients with dysphagia or regurgitation. And breakthrough or reflux-like symptoms stem from some combination of reflux hypersensitivity, hypervigilance, psychiatric comorbidities, and misdiagnosis. These rarely respond to the latter approach of escalating acid inhibition or surgery. 
address the brain gut dysfunction with cognitive behavioral therapy. If you have this resource, use it. It's amazing. The patients actually like it once they get over the notion that you're telling them they're crazy. <laughs> Thank you. By the way, I gave you back the one minute I ran over. <laughs> okay, uh, so I want to introduce uh, my partner, uh, Ji Young Bang, who's going to present some cases to, uh, uh, to uh, try to stump uh, our, uh, our panel or at least um, elucidate some excellent uh, conversation and uh, debate back and forth. So Ji, go, go to it. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. We're going to be answering some questions this session, so if you could... Uh, take a picture of the QR code so we can all participate. That'd be wonderful. All right, so I've got some cases here. Um, so without further ado, we'll move on. So first patient is a 19-year-old female with heartburn and regurgitation for 10 years. Uh, she's also fatigued. Past medical history, significant for chronic tension, headache, depression, iron deficiency, anemia. Labs are really notable for anemia, hemoglobin of 11.5, um, normal LFTs, BMP, thyroid function panel is normal, and she is iron deficient. So she underwent an EGD um, here at the Digestive Health Institute, and these are the findings. Uh, so this is the first question, what is the diagnosis? I'll give you a few seconds to answer, and then we'll move on. Excellent. So the EGD actually shows some longitudinal furrows, plaques, mucosal edema, uh, which was consistent with endoscopic images of eosinophilic esophagitis that was actually confirmed on biopsies um, with distal and um, proximal esophageal biopsy showing elevated eosinophil count of 25 to 30 uh, eosinophils per high power field. So our next uh, question is, what do we do for the patient? Again, this is uh, if you could answer on the polls. So um, before we move on to what we actually did for the patient, any, um, I would like to throw the question to our panel. We can move, uh, we can start with Dr. Horse. <laughs> no, start with our experts. <laughs> no, start, Dr. Hirano. Can we have the microphones turned on, please? Yeah, I, I think um, that endoscopic view, the findings were relatively subtle there um, with like edema, maybe some scattered extra dead. I couldn't tell how much of that might have been, even just some saliva there, but, um, but it looks like mostly an inflammatory phenotype. The patient doesn't have dysphagia, has more heartburn symptoms, which is atypical. Uh, most patients with EOE present with dysphagia. So it looks like you've caught the patient pretty early in their course of disease. So I, I, I think you asked me what therapy, I, I think um, I would, I typically start with PPI therapy virtually 100% of the time. And just for high dose, I use just a, high, a double dose once a day. I just use Omeprazole 40. That's, I just get the least amount of uh, kickback from insurance companies with that. So I would choose Omeprazole 40 once a day and then repeat an endoscopy in about two to three months. Wonderful. Uh, anyone in the panel who would do anything differently? Dr. Wani, Dr. Harris? No, I'd just echo what Iko said about that endoscopy. I'm not sure I would have called it abnormal. And um, I would have just started normal dose PPI on this as well. It's that overlap between reflux and eosinophilic esophagitis. Again, no dysphagia uh, and positive eosinophils. Okay, so yeah, so this is um, what my colleague did for the patient. Uh, she was started on omeprazole, 40 milligrams of POBID for eight weeks and underwent an EGD. And this is what we found. So um, she had a normal endoscopy exam but when biopsy was repeated, she had persistent elevated eosinophilic um, count on biopsies with 22 and 60. 
the xenophil counts per high power field. So um, our next question, and this is something that we're still pending uh, for this particular patient, is what do we do next? So again, if you could answer the questions and then I'll throw the question to the panel. You're shortchanging us here by not telling us what the symptomatic response was. Yeah. Yeah, that's, um, the patient still had persistent symptoms of kind of the general heartburn and, and fatigue and all those things. Yeah, she did not really have dysphagia symptoms. Did, did, did she get biopsies anywhere else? Uh, did she have e eosinophilia, um, uh, stomach, uh, the duodenum? Did she get biopsies other places? No, she had uh, gastric and duodenal biopsies, which were normal. Normal, basically. no eosin. Okay. Um. I guess the, the question <laughs> is, do you, do you treat a, a biopsy? Um. I, I'm going to let Eco answer that first, because I think we have a different opinion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's, there's absolutely a dissociation between what you see histologically and uh, what you see endoscopically and symptoms. Those are three targets, right? Endoscopic healing, mucosal healing, symptomatic benefit, and histologic benefit. And those three targets don't always overlap. When they do, it's great, but when they don't, then you have to think about what to do. If the patient felt great, and then I might agree with Peter, I might uh, choose just to watch them, follow them. Um, if they felt great and the endoscopy looked that great, um, looked normal to me, um, then I wouldn't be looking to escalate therapy at that particular. I would follow them because maybe those eosinophils will be bad actors and cause some structures over time. So I'd repeat a scope in maybe one or two years. But since you're saying the symptomatic, then I think you have to do further investigation. So you have persistent symptoms and persistent histopathology, even though the endoscopy looks better. And maybe this will be a kickback to Peter about uh, kind of a kind of a GERD type um, phenotype here where heartburn and persistent symptoms with some mucosal inflammation. So I would probably, before going on to anything else, I'd probably do some further investigation with uh, physiologic testing, with uh, manometry and a pH test. We must work together. <laughs> Absolutely, because this doesn't make sense. So I would discontinue the treatment and do a pH monitoring study. So um, that's what we'll plan for the patient. But the big yeah. distinction, though, is the patient's symptoms. The, yeah. it, not only the presence, but it's heartburn. If you had said dysphagia, then I, it's a completely different uh, ball of wax. Then I would say make sure you did that enlightened endoscopic exam. Make sure there wasn't a misstructure at the EJ. Make sure you don't have a subtle structure in the, you know, the esophageal body. You do a barium esophagram, et cetera. But here you're saying it's heartburn, no dysphagia and you've got persistent mucosal inflammation and persistent heartburn. So you've got to look where this GERD and EOE overlap is occurring, and I think testing will help to just differentiate that. Excellent. And I think this discussion reflects the complexities we encounter when managing patients with EOE. And if you look at the AJ guidelines on the management of EOE, Actually, the guidelines are very vague. If you look at the strength recommendation, majority of the recommendations are conditional recommendations with either, uh, at best, moderate, um, and usually low or very low quality. So the um, only recommendation that the AGA makes in patients with diagnosis of EOE is that the AGA recommends topical glucocorticoids over no treatment. So um, this is... Um, you know, in a patient, let's say, you know, for argument's sake, we're 100% convinced this patient has EOE with symptoms that we're definitely treating, um, and we are trying to figure out what's going to be the next steps in management. Um, the guidelines are very unclear from what I read on exactly uh, which treatment should go, uh, which should follow. Uh, follow what? So um, there was actually a systematic review and a meta-analysis comparing the different types of medications for EOE. And after I go through the study, I'll throw it to the panel, of course, to see what they would do in terms of kind of the systematic algorithmic approach to someone with EOE. But basically, this systematic review and meta-analysis included 15 randomized trials uh, which looked at topical steroids, PPIs, biologics, and compared it with each other and also with placebo in patients over the age of 12 with EOE um, who underwent treatment for at least six weeks. 
And depending on the uh, outcome measure that you're looking for, uh, the best medication to achieve that outcome goal actually varied. So when they looked at eosinophilic infiltrate reduction of at least six or less per high field on biopsies to achieve histological remission, they actually found that lin lirantelumab actually performed the best of all the medications. If they looked at histological remission to achieve eosinophil infiltrate of 15 uh, or less eosinophils per high field, Actually, budesonide, oral disintegrating tablet, appeared to perform the best out of all the medications. When looking at the aim of achieving symptom improvement, uh, budesonide, either as an orally disintegrating tablet or oral suspension, appeared to be significantly more efficacious than placebo. And when looking at endoscopic improvement, budesonide, again, appeared to be superior to placebo and uh, was the best uh, performing out of all the medications that they uh, compared to. So um, the, what I wanted to throw to the panel, and I think this will really help our audience, is what do you do? Because obviously, with conditions like UC and Crohn's, it's a very systematic algorithmic approach when we're dealing with patients with you know, acute attacks. So in patients with EOE, um, I was wondering whether they could just give us some idea and guidance of kind of step-by-step -step approach to someone who are not responding to the initial treatment of PPI and persistent symptoms and histological um, uh, biopsies that are positive. I'm sorry, Dr. Hirana, we'll start with you. What's that? We'll start with you. Do you have a systematic approach to managing someone like this with persistent biopsies? Sure. Um, let's say all well, the testing, you're, con you're convinced that the patient definitely has EOE and you want to go ahead and treat. Yeah, I think in a, in a more classic patient with EOE that's not responding to initial trial PPI therapy, um, then it opens up to either medical or dietary therapy. Um, medications now being swallowed topical steroids off-label in the U.S. That preparation that you mentioned that had high efficacy um, in that gut, gut study was not, is available only in Europe and Canada. It's not available in the U.S. That's a, a budesonide tablet that we don't have. So we're still using off-label fluticasone or budesonide. Or now we have the approval um, just a year and a half ago of dupilumab for eosinophilic esophagitis. So those would be your two medical options. And for dietary options, we still have the empirical elimination Diet, which is quite effective for patients who are willing to do an elimination diet. So typically, at that point, it's a shared decision making. Not every patient wants to do medications, and not every patient wants to do diet. Some proportion, I use in my practice, maybe 25, 30% will choose to do dietary therapy. They don't want to do pharmacologic therapy. And if they choose that, that's fine. We go down the dietary route. And if they go for medical therapy, then um, a little bit now is being unfortunately dictated by insurance companies where they're requiring for dipilumab, that is, um, that they will not accept just PPI failure alone as being a uh, reason to use dipilumab. They want you to fail something else, um, particularly steroid therapy, even though it's off-label. So you'll usually have to document, some have do some documentation for many insurance companies of a failed response to swallowed topical steroids before you can move on to a biologic like dipilumab. So typically my practice has been that. I've been mostly using dipilumab in patients who have already failed some other form of primary therapy before going on to dipilumab. Excellent, thank you. Um, I'm still skeptical about this case. <laughs> <laughs> about the diagnosis yes. or about? Yes. So yes, you, that was a normal looking esophagus. Uh, so and you think we have bad pathologists? Is that no, no, there are eosinophils <laughs> there, but it's, it's the relevance of it. You're not treating eosinophilia, you know, you're treating symptoms. And uh, these aren't classic symptoms of eosinophilic esophagitis. But Iku said the difference, you are treating the, the eosinophils. He says you've got to get rid of the eosinophil. Well, I don't think, that's where we disagree. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Okay. Case two. Thank you. Two. All right, case two. I've got three more cases. I'm going to go really fast. So it's Barrett's for the next three cases. So this is a 43-year-old um, male with long-standing GERD, and this is the um, EGD. Um, so basically, you're going to see a long segment of Barrett's, um, and biopsies of the distal esophagus was performed, and that showed low-grade dysplasia. 
Um, and that was confirmed on um, review by a second pathologist with expertise in uh, GI pathology. All right, so question is, what's the next step in management? Yep. Go ahead, Sachin. Yep, so I, I think um, you've highlighted uh, many important points in this uh, case. I think one of the things uh, that was done during this endoscopic exam that um, you demonstrated was using a distal attachment cap. This was a high quality exam using a combination of high definition white light and uh, virtual chromo endoscopy. What G also brought up, which is really important to do, is to confirm the diagnosis of any dysplasia by an expert. Uh, pathologist. So this was confirmed as low-grade uh, dysplasia. Uh, I think in the last few seconds, you tried to demonstrate a few abnormal findings on narrowband imaging. I couldn't tell, but my, my approach to low-grade dysplasia is bring these uh, patients back and look for presence, if the patient's not randomized into the servant trial, is to look for any visible lesions within the Barrett's uh, uh, segment. So my first approach is to perform resection. Uh, the the one thing I will say is that very often um, patients with low-grade dysplasia that get referred to a tertiary care center, in 30% of those patients you will identify actually high-grade dysplasia or early cancer. So uh, be very skeptical of this diagnosis of low-grade dysplasia because you will upstage the diagnosis in 30% either by an expert pathology review or when you perform a repeat endoscopy and perform uh, mucosal resection. On the flip side, important to note that in about 70% of the cases that get referred to a tertiary care center or an expert center, you will have the diagnosis downgraded to non-dysplastic and low-grade dysplasia. The other important thing to remember is that these patients need to be on BID PPI therapy when they do get diagnosed with low-grade dysplasia because our pathologists really struggle in differentiating between reactive atypia and low-grade dysplasia. Looks so the, like, gee, you made the decision to proceed with the So the bottom line is that uh, confirmed low-grade dysplasia, apart from your trial, you would treat. Uh, visible lesions you'll resect and uh, absolutely smooth Barrett's you will treat. Yeah, so I mean, you treat and, and consistent, confirm low-grade display. Uh, consistent with what we've talked about, EOE, I think it's a shared decision-making approach. Mm -hmm. Recognize that surveillance for low-grade is also perfectly fine. So I bring these patients to my clinic and then discuss these two treatment strategies, ablation versus surveillance. Okay, Jean. Uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so the EGD was um, performed after the patient was referred to us after the distal biopsy showing low-grade dysplasia. The exam that we showed beforehand uh, was the exam that we performed. There were no lesions or nodularity um, requiring resection, so the patient underwent um, RFA. Uh, this is a circumferential RFA using a 360 Marex balloon, and um, um, yeah, and that's pretty much it. And the patient will return in two, three months for repeat RFA of any remaining sessions until. Uh, there's complete um, resolution of um, intestinal metaplasia. So next um, is just the question of whether to perform uh, ablation or endoscopic surveillance, like we uh, ablation or endoscopic surveillance for patients with um, low-grade dysplasia, um, but without visible lesions, which obviously uh, will need to be resected. And uh, this is the only randomized trial I could find so far that was performed um, small... Um, uh, relatively small study, 136 patients published in JAMA 10 years ago. And basically what this shows is that if you perform ablation, um, there is a, a significantly lower risk of progression to high-grade dysplasia and cancer um, 
when compared to just surveillance. And this is taken from the ACG guidelines published in 2022. And uh, like Dr. Wani was um, mentioning, uh, the guidelines do recommend either surveillance or uh, endoscopic uh, eradication with RFA uh, for patients with low-grade dysplasia uh, without lesions requiring resection. So next is another patient with Barrett's. This is another Gee, patient with... Can I just make the, one point about yes. why um, some of the results from the SURF trial may not necessarily be applicable to the U.S. population because the rates of progression that they described in the Dutch cohort are some of the highest rates of progression that has ever been um, reported. It's also important to note that from that trial, again, they had a significant number of patients that were were actually downgraded to this diagnosis of non-dysplastic based on subsequent endoscopies. By that I mean this phenomenon of regression is seen in this patient population where in about 66% of cases you're not going to demonstrate the diagnosis of low-grade dysplasia. And then finally, in this entire randomized control trial, there was only one patient that actually required an esophagectomy for progression. So the point I'm trying to make is that we need to to have better risk stratification tools for low-grade dysplasia rather than having this approach of ablating all patients that you see with low-grade. Thank you, Dr. Wani. So this is, again, a patient with long segment Barrett's underwent EGD. And I just wanted to show this case because the esophagus of this patient looks slightly different to the esophagus from the last case. So as you can see, you can see visible nodularity, lesions. Um, and so we're going to manage this patient slightly differently. Um, as you can see, there's a lesion here. This one to get resected. Um, and here as well. So biopsies, again, of um, random biopsies of the esophagus showed actually high-grade dysplasia in this patient and then was referred to us for further management. So um, for the sake of time um, constraints, um, We'll maybe forego the quiz, but um, basically the patient's going to need um, endoscopic resection of those visible lesions. And there is not really clear guideline on whether you're going to perform EMR or ESD in these cases. And um, what we chose to do for this patient was perform EMR of those areas of nodularity, as we'll show here. Um, and um, maybe Dr. Wani can just describe to us quickly what, how you make a decision about ESD versus EMR in these, yeah, in sure. these kinds of patients. I think the vast majority of cases can be managed with the technique that you're describing in this video, which is the multiband mucosectomy uh, technique. Um, the cases where I would consider doing ESD is if there's any endoscopic evidence for potential of submucosal invasion. Those are the only patients that I would actually consider uh, performing an ESD. The vast majority can be managed using um, this uh, multiband mucosectomy technique. The other um, uh, patient population that I would consider ESD is if there is significant amount of scarring within the area of nodularity where someone else has attempted to resect that lesion and has been unsuccessful. So, um, and you can see um, beautiful images of multiband mucosectomy technique, and it's hard to argue that you would do any better by doing um, submucosal uh, dissection in a case like this. Thank you. So the, um, again, data on ESD versus EMR, this was a patient with high-grade dysplasia where we performed an ESD. I'll show you kind of the difference that you can see uh, really quickly. We marked it and then you resect it with a knife. And this is what this patient's lesion looked like after resection. And in terms of the technique that we're going to be using for resecting patients with dysplastic um, Barris esophagus with lesions that requiring uh, resection. Again, there is no good quality um, large um, sample randomized trial. This is again from a, a multi center study published in GUT, a very small sample of 40 patients. And what they uh, showed in this randomized trial was that, yes, actually the incomplete rate of, uh, rate of incomplete resection with EMR was higher than compared to ESD. But when they looked at the complete remission of neoplasia at the end of follow-up, actually there wasn't much significant difference between these two techniques. 
And so we need large randomized trials, which our center is a part of. It's called BIPA trial. We're one of the centers, along with centers in Europe. So um, with that in mind, uh, we shall uh, conclude the session. Um, we're a little overdue, but um, thank you so much. Right. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for our panel. Uh, a great discussion.